Okay, I'd like us to turn, please, in the Bible this evening to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians and chapter 1. And I'm going to read uh, just a few verses from verse 26 down to verse 29. And I want to consider this evening the kind of man God uses in revival. And I have a particular individual in mind that I'm going to be looking at this evening. But before we consider this man, I want to read this passage. And so it begins this way. It says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world. Things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. And God will bless that short reading from his precious word. So the man that I want to think about, and I've been spending time with this man for the last month, is a man called D.L. Moody. And I read this biography, and I want to just heartily commend it. In fact, Louis Palau uh, writes in the back of it, he says, every Christian should read Moody. It is one of the few books that I say is must-reading. And I heartily agree with him, uh, by the way, written by a man called John Pollock, who was an Anglican preacher who had a pretty successful ministry preaching in his parish, but he, he quit to devote himself to researching and writing Christian biographies because he saw how inspirational good biographies were on Christian living. And so he wrote several biographies, including Moody, a, a magnificent biography of John Wesley, probably one of the best ones on Wesley I've ever read. He wrote about Wilberforce and uh, a few others, uh, but uh, particularly the Wesley and the Moody one are just precious, and I would really heartily recommend them. So uh, concerning uh, Pollock, as well as using this as a resource for our thoughts this evening. I'm also using, um, Ari Tori wrote a little booklet called Why God Used D.L. Moody. And so I'm going to use that as a basis, why God used D.L. Moody, but then embellish it with things that I've seen in this particular biography, just to kind of, as it were, pad it out a little bit. So uh, in terms of what the Tori and his uh, assessment of things, he had seven points that he considered why God used D.L. Moody. And by the way, he used him in revival on both sides of the continent. So revival in the United States, many, many places he saw revival, uh, including places like New York City, Chicago, of course, which we were very familiar with. But over in the UK, he was greatly used of God in Edinburgh and Glasgow and London, and really took the UK by storm, had a tremendous impact, not just when he was there, but for generations afterwards. And so God really used this man in revival in marvelous ways. So R.A. Torrey, who was very closely associated with Moody in his latter years, uh, he had uh, Torrey as the uh, first principal of Moody Bible Institute. And so uh, they were very close in, his, in Moody's latter years. He said there are seven things that stood out. First of all, he was a fully surrendered man. Somebody who had fully surrendered his life to the cause of Christ. And we're going to look at each of them individually. I'm just going to give you the list to begin with. Secondly, he was a man of prayer. Thirdly, he was a deep and practical student of the Bible. Fourthly, he was a humble man. Fifthly, he was a man free, entirely free, from the love of money. Six, his consuming passion was for the salvation of the lost. And number seven, he was endued with power from on high. And so, brethren, if we can get those seven, I think we might be we might be eagles rather than chickens, as we were talking about earlier. We might be soaring in heavenly places if we could get those seven things uh, in our own lives. The other thing that I want to bring out this evening, too, is the influence of lesser-known uh, evangelists, two of them in particular, who were 
uh, connected with the assembly movement, uh, the open brethren movement. Uh, these would be Henry Varley and then Harry Morehouse. And I want to kind of look at how these lives connected and how Moody was shaped by these lesser known men in a profound way. And so that's what we plan to do uh, this particular time. He also, by the way, was influenced greatly by C.H. McIntosh. And uh, the notes on the Pentateuch by McIntosh, Moody bought them in caseloads and gave them to any aspiring Bible student he could find because it had done his soul that much good. He wanted others to come into the good of Mr. McIntosh's writing. You might say, well, why are we doing this this evening? I want to just mention three three reasons why we want to do this. And I'm going to kind of do it part one and part two. So we're going to do it over the next two uh, evenings. Uh, so firstly, I think it's a sad thing today, but generally it's true that that people are not readers in our generation. And so because people are maybe not too likely to pick up a book like this and read it, uh, what I want to do is at least try and distill some of the good that I got out of it so that it might be good to someone. Because I really feel feel like uh, there's such a loss. I, I think of how enriched my own life has been through reading these great books. And I feel sad that in a sense, there's a generation coming up that are just not readers anymore. And I feel that they, there's a poverty uh, because of that. And uh, so secondly, we're praying for revival, but I guess we need to ask ourselves the question, are we the kind of men that God can trust with revival? Can he trust us with this kind of thing? Because we want to see it. And what I would say is Moody was such a man that God could entrust with revival. Are we such men? Thirdly, Scripture, as we know, has written into it its own Hall of Fame, the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11. One of the things that thrills my soul is that Hebrews 11 did not end at chapter 11, <laughs> that God still has his heroes that inspire generations today through their service and their faith and their love for the Lord Jesus. And so it's good to just think of these men that uh, it didn't just end at the end of chapter 11. It continues to be written in a sense, uh, certainly written on high, but there are great men of faith and we thank God for each one of them. I guess the main thing is this, the God who used D.L. Moody in his day is just as ready and willing to use you and I if we meet the criteria that Mr. Moody met, he, he wants to use us too. So we'll start with the fact that he was a fully surrendered man. Of course, Romans 12, verse 1, I'm going to tie scripture in with each of these points, but uh, we, we know it well. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And so the first thing that accounts for God using D.L. Moody so mightily was that he was a man who was fully surrendered. Every ounce of that 280-pound body, that's 27, uh, 127 kilograms or 20 stone. <laughs> so he was, uh, he was quite the man towards the end of his life. <laughs> he was a stout fellow, as they would say. And uh, yet uh, every ounce of that that 280-pound body, was fully surrendered and devoted to the Lord Jesus. Everything he was and everything he had belonged wholly to God. You might ask, how did this full surrender come about in his life? Well, it all began with a conversation with a man who we've already mentioned called Henry Varley. While he was visiting the British Isles, his first visit to the British Isles in 1872, he was in Dublin, actually, in Ireland, sat on a park bench conversing with Mr. Varley. And in the midst of that conversation, Varley made this comment, well-known comment, you've heard it before, but this is what he said. He said, it remains to be seen what God will do with a man who gives himself up wholly to him. Well, some have said, a man who fully consecrates himself to him. So it remains to be seen what God will do with a man who gives himself up wholly to him. Moody initially made no comment, but the words burned in his soul for days. Moody kept saying to himself, Varley was referring to any man. He didn't say he had to be educated 
or scholarly, just a man. Well, by the Holy Spirit in me, I'll be that man. And he made a decision there and then that he would consecrate himself fully to the Lord and see what God would do with that life. And of course, the rest is history. And so, again, there's the influence of Mr. Varley. Now, we're going to see more of the influence of Mr. Varley. We're not quite done with him yet, but he did have a powerful influence on Mr. Moody. However, before we move on to the next point, it might be good to ask ourselves this question posed in the refrain of a well-known hymn. It may be good afterwards if one of the brothers would sing it to us. But this is the refrain. It says this, Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. And answer the question, Mr. Moody, is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? His life told the story. Yes, it definitely was. He was a fully consecrated man. And therefore, God used him tremendously. And he can use us too if we would willingly present our bodies. And sometimes we often say the problem is, that with a living sacrifice is that sometimes it can get off the altar. Maybe some of us tonight need to get back on the altar and say, Lord, I've strayed, but here I am. I present myself afresh to you. I want to be used by you. I want to be somebody you could entrust revival with. I give myself fully to you without hesitation. Second thing we said was he was a man of prayer. And again, we want to tie this into the scripture. And I want to go to uh, one that's very familiar, the book of James, chapter 5, uh, an Old Testament servant of God greatly used, and that's Elijah. And in James 5, we know the verse as well. It says in verse 17, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. It's good to know, isn't it? He was just like us, a man just like us. A man made of the same cookie dough we're made out of, so to speak, a man of like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. And so, again, we, we need to ask ourselves, are we men of prayer? Now, I think we can all say, and I think this prayer group is helping us to grow in prayer. And we thank God for that. I mean, I'm, I thank the Lord every day for, for this group of men who are committed to prayer and its, its impact, its influence on my own prayer life. But again, what if the group ended? Would we continue to be men of prayer? Well, once more, Mr. Henry Varley has a deep impact on the life of D.L. Moody. Varley was at one time a wholesale butcher in the West End of London. And he had become a very successful evangelist among open assemblies, often preaching in mission halls to huge crowds and particularly reaching the masses, the working classes with the gospel message. And Moody, when he went over to the UK the first time, primarily was he was exhausted and he was his wife had suggested he needed to get some inspiration, some encouragement. And so he was looking up people like Spurgeon, uh, other men that uh, he had thought about, uh, he wanted to learn from them. And so he he went and visited Henry Varley. And when he was in his home, they were going out to speak that night. He was, was Henry Varley, and Moody was accompanying him. And so before they left his house, he said, well, let's just pray about the meeting. And so they prayed about the meeting, and then they got in a, a carriage uh, a rented carriage, horse and cab. And as they're going over the cobblestones of London, the rickety rackety noise and all the rest of it, Mr. Varley said, let's get on our knees and let's ask the Lord for blessing on the meeting. Now, they'd already prayed about the meeting before they left, but he said, let's do it again. And so Moody was kind of shocked. He'd never tried praying before on the floor of a carriage. And so they got on their knees on this carriage and they began to pray. And then they got to this service, and he watched as Varley preached, and 70 butchers who were the same trade that he probably had met in his wholesale business or whatever, came forward, tears running down their cheeks around this man of God to receive Christ. And so Moody recognized there and then, I know what the secret of Varley's power is. 
he's a man of prayer. And so, Moody, one of the things that, that comes out in this book is that one of the things that was stood out about Dale Moody was he never stopped learning and he never stopped growing. He's always learning from others and he's seeking to incorporate what he learns into his life. And so he saw this in Valley's life and he said, I need to be a man of prayer. And so he became a great man of prayer. In fact, this is what R.A. Torrey said. Now, again, he comes on the scene much later, right? So Henry Valley's early on, 1872. This, this is decade later. R.A. Torrey's on the scene. And this is his comment on Deal Moody. He became acquainted with Moody in his latter years, and he had this to say about him. Out of a very intimate acquaintance with him, I wish to testify that he was a far greater prayer prayer than he was a preacher. By the way, he was a great preacher. But R.A. Torrey said he was a greater prayer than he was a preacher. I, I think he understood Acts 6, 4. The apostles said, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. That lovely combination. D.L. Moody gave himself to prayer and the ministry of the word, and God used him tremendously. He said this, he knew and believed in the deepest, deepest depths of his soul that nothing was too hard for the Lord. So not only did he pray, he prayed with confidence because he knew at the very depths of his soul, nothing was too hard for the Lord. Well, that's tremendous, isn't it? When you pray with that confidence, that helps. And he did. Often, if he was entering into a new campaign in his later years, he would call the student body at Moody Bible Institute for an all-night prayer meeting before he would enter into these campaigns. This is what Tori said as he was the principal of the school. He says, how many men and women I have known whose lives and characters have been transformed by those nights of prayer and who have wrought mighty things in many lands because of those nights of prayer. And the inspiration to it all was D.L. Moody, the man of prayer. He was the one who called for this. He was the one who was encouraging the students. Part of the whole training there was to train workers, not academics, not people with heads full of facts, but workers for God. And going to be an effective worker for God, we need to know how to lay hold on God in prayer. And so he was a man who met every difficulty that stood in his way by prayer. Wow, what a tremendous man he was. Well, we're just going to squeeze one more in, and then I'm going to stop. I was thought I'd get four done tonight, but I think we'll just settle for three, and we'll have to leave the number the other four for next time. He was a deep and practical Bible student. Again, Second Timothy chapter two, verse fifteen. We're told this, aren't we? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We now think about another brethren evangelist that also left a deep impression upon D.L. Moody. That's Harry Morehouse. I'm sure we've all heard the story of how Mr. Morehouse preached for a week in Moody's church in Chicago on John 3.16. Moody was away for a lot of it. When he came back, his wife, Emma, said this to him, said, this man, he says, you tell sinners that God hates them. He tells sinners that God loves them. Moody said, he must be wrong. She said, you better listen to him. And he did indeed listen as Mr. Morehouse traced another message of John 3.16 through the entire text of Scripture, showing how much God loves sinners and the lengths that God has gone to to reach sinners. And so... He had a great impact, of course, on Moody's preaching. Uh, as a result of this, he realized that he needed to change his preaching. But what we often don't hear is the rest of the story, because he also told Moody this important lesson. He says, teach what the Bible says, not your own words. Show people how much God loves them from the text itself. He made him see that it's God's word, not our comments 
upon it that saves souls. Morehouse taught him how to read and study the Bible. Moody had always looked at the, on the Bible as a textbook and a weapon, viewing it as an armory of well-worn texts whereon to peg talks and sermons. He was curiously ignorant of much of what the Bible taught. Morehouse told him he did not know the Bible. Imagine that, this famous evangelist and Harry Morehouse says, your problem, Mr. Moody, is you don't know the Bible. <laughs> And so he showed him how to treat it as a self-contained whole, how to trace the unfolding themes of Scripture. And he also told him he should take time, more time to take in from Scripture than he was giving out because he would soon become empty, like an empty can. He needed to be a man who took in. So he basically taught Moody how to study the Scriptures. A friend of Moody said Moody had great power before he met Morehouse, but nothing like that which was seen after his encounter with little Harry Morehouse. Years later, Torrey would comment, and I love this. He said he, he was a deep and practical student of the Word of God. Nowadays, it's often said that D.L. Moody, he was not a student. I wish to say that he was a student most emphatically, he was a student. He was not a student of psychology. He was not a student of anthropology. I'm very sure he would not have known what the word meant. He was not a student of biology. He was not a student of philosophy. He was not even a student of theology in the technical sense of the term. But he was a student, a profound and practical student of one book, that is more, has more worth to it than studying all the books in the world put together. He was a student of the Bible. Mr. Moody used to rise at four o'clock in the morning every day to study the Bible. He would say, if I'm going to get in any study, I've got to get up before other folks get up. And he would shut himself up in a remote room in the house alone with God and his Bible. If you wish to get an audience, this is Tori saying, he says, and if you want to do some good for that audience, study, study, study that one book and preach, preach, preach that one book. And of course, Moody could do this. Even during the World's Fair, Moody booked theaters when all the theaters were closed because nobody assumed anybody would do anything when the World's Fair was on. It was supposed to be one of the events of the century. And Moody booked a theater and filled it every single day. In Chicago, he, he was there for a week and he didn't want to interrupt the regular meetings of the churches. So he would schedule meetings at nine o'clock in the morning and at one o'clock in the afternoon. The business community were incensed. Why would you do that? Nobody can come. Everybody's got to work. Moody says, book the halls. And sure enough, 8,000 people showed up to hear him teach the Bible, and there were 8,000 people outside who couldn't get in. In a weekday, business day, because he was a man who knew the book and knew how to communicate it. Well, we often say we want to see revival. Some of our dear Indian brethren, they have difficulty sometimes with saying the word B. Sometimes they, uh, V, should I say, in revival. So sometimes instead of saying revival, they say revival. They put a B instead of a V. And I think they're onto something. What we need is a revival. <laughs> A, a, a renewed passion for the book like Dale Moody had. So that's three. We've got another four to do. We'll have to wait till next time because we're here to pray and we want to make sure we give ourselves to prayer. But may the Lord help us to at least learn and keep on learning. Don't ever feel like we've arrived. Dale Moody never felt till his dying breath that he'd arrived. He was always learning. Much we can learn from a man like this. May the Lord encourage us.